Welcome to Idioms of Normality. I'm coming to you from Camaragal country in Sydney, Australia, and I'm your host, Paul Mason. And I'm here with Dr. Bob Rich, who is on Wurundjeri country. Welcome, Dr. Rich. Thank you, Paul. Now, before we get started, what perspectives and experiences do you bring to the question, what is normal? Most not normal. I don't want to say abnormal, but I'm the least normal person you've ever met. So I'm very well qualified to discuss the topic. I mean, I've retired five times so far from five different occupations. and So far? One, yeah, I still write. I'm write, you know, writing books and things. And I do editing where I'm as much a teacher as an editor. And most important, I'm a professional grandfather. Oh, that's which the best job of all. And I've got hundreds and hundreds of grandchildren all over the world. Things like nationality, skin color, religion, language, irrelevant. All they need to do is to apply. I love it. I love it. Mm. So these are not biological grandchildren. They are, they are adopted surrogate grandchildren. Well, look, you probably qualify as a child. You won't qualify as a grandchild. <laughs> Anybody born after not, not 1987 or so qualifies as my child after 1992 approximately as my grandchild. Okay. Well, as a professional grandfather and someone who has had uh, several different careers in one lifetime, how do you answer the question, what is normal? Normal is the walking wounded. Normal is the walking wounded. Correct. Look, sometimes when people ask me to say something about myself, I use a different introduction. I say, I'm a visitor from a faraway galaxy. At home, I'm a historian of horror. And because of this earth is my favorite place in all the universe. No? There's nowhere else, nowhere else in this universe where people play a game where sentient beings murder each other. That game is called war. Nowhere else in the universe is the entire global economy designed to wreck a species life support system. And nowhere else are child raising practices designed to damage children. How bizarre is that? Just lovely for a historian of horror. But it's not everywhere. Many pre-industrial societies had sane child raising practices. And even today, for example, the Inuit in, in Alaska and northern Canada, given the harsh environment, children need to follow orders so you know they can die. But they're never punished, never verbally abused, not even shouted at. All discipline is given with very obvious unconditional love. At the other side, of course, there's always a balance, there's the golden middle. Let me tell you about an experiment with dogs in the 1950s. Like sex litter mates were chosen, and the control dogs were given to uh, families, just normal families as pets. The experimental dogs were, given, were put into doggy heaven. No infection, no pain, every wish instantly gratified. At two years of age, the experimental dogs were given as pets to match families with their control. The controls didn't matter. Within six months, every one of the experimental dogs was dead. Some died from infections because they didn't have the antibodies, but most died from depression. You give a bit of a knock to an ordinary dog, gets up and get, gets going, maybe ranges a bit. Slightest pain to one of these dogs, and, and they couldn't go for three, four days. What happens if you're half an hour late at home and your dog get, gets his meal a bit late? they will complain, eat the meal, and everything is all right. These dogs couldn't cope with it. They just fall into a heap. So the perfect attitude is the golden middle. My latest published book is titled 
from depression to contentment, a self-therapy guide. In that, what I say about parenting is childhood abuse leads to adult suffering, and there's a lot of experimental research for that. Overprotection leads to vulnerability. Perfect parenting is rules imposed with firm but loving discipline. It's unconditional love and acceptance while allowing the child to learn from mistakes. Clear rules firmly enforced with unconditional love and the complete absence of physical and mental abuse. If that's how we raised our kids, we'd have a good world. Their normal would be okay. But as it is, normal is the walking wounded. Normal is the walking wounded in the absence of healthy parenting, I see. It's a, it's a sobering story that you share about the, the dogs who were given every luxury in the world, all their needs addressed without letting them suffer any mild complaint and then not surviving longer than six months in the, in the open world. I, I resonate that with that strongly because I've seen that firsthand, what it can do to, uh, you know, we have prolonged neoteny in, in humans and that neoteny uh, has been prolonged even further than adolescence in industrialized, educated, rich, democratic populations. And you get people at 30 who don't know how to do their own washing, don't know how to do their own cooking, um, because everything has been outsourced. And then they're thrown into the world. They might experience rent or a mortgage for the first time. They might have to handle bills for the first time. And also, culture throws at them the idea that they should have children. And then suddenly, they're thrown into a milieu where they don't have any resilience anymore. So it's a very sobering story that you share and, and the, the importance of having boundaries, but also the importance of not having punishing discipline or abusive discipline. And it's one thing I would, I would perhaps add to your story, and I don't usually do this, so forgive me for interjecting, is that I think we also need, need to give parents permission to get it wrong. You know, parents permission to make mistakes. Spot on. In fact, I didn't quote it, but in my book, the next two sentences say, but you don't have to be perfect. Parents are allowed to make mistakes. Because that's actually one of the positive psychology tools of tolerance applied to others and to yourself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's so important to have tolerance for yourself because if you can't have tolerance or patience or understanding for your own experience, how can you expect to have it for other people? Yeah. I agree. When, when I was young, uh, about till about 43 years of age, most of my flashbacks were about things that people had done to me. But if I have a flashback now, it's some mistake I've made that caused harm to somebody else. Then, I'm sorry, I can't undo it. I'm doing my best. It's okay. It's interesting how we, we, a little bit of that ego drips away over time and we become more self-reflective when we give ourselves permission to just be a person experiencing the world. Mm. Well, one of my cliches is every sentient being is an apprentice Buddha or an apprentice every Jesus. Every sentient being is an apprentice symbol of perfection. <laughs> Enlightened person. An, 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 an apprentice, enlightened person. I like that. And tell me a bit more about apprenticeship. What does apprenticeship look like? What are the benefits of it? Why holding on to that idea that we're an apprentice? What, what does that do for us? Well, whether you know it or not, the reason for you being on this planet is to become enlightened eventually. You can't do it in one life, although some versions of Buddhism say you can, and Jesus said you can, but I think for most people it takes perhaps thousands of lives. So but, uh, there is a version of psych psych psychotherapy called AC uh, ACT, but you say ACT because it's action. Acceptance and commitment therapy. Okay, acceptance, commitment therapy, yeah. And that's one of the ones. My book has three segments. First, I set up, well, not four really. First, there is first aid, things people can immediately do. Then I set out 
the, the situation. Then there is therapy, which brings the suffering person up to normal. And then the last part is positive psychology and spirituality, not religion, but spirituality, which gets you way above normal. Normal is down there. Okay, so this is interesting. So but Anyway, one, I'm sorry. One of the therapies I co cover is ACT, and that basically says what Socrates said, seem the man you wish to be. You know the story of Marathon? The marathon we had we we talked about this actually in in a previous episode. Yes, go on. Yeah, yeah. This young man came came to Socrates and said, "Look, I'm a coward. How oh, do you know you're a coward? I'm terrified in battle." Now Socrates didn't pat him on the head and say, "Everybody is." He said, "Seem the man you wish to be." Oh. Okay. Thirty, Thirty years later, a hundred and fifty thousand Persians landed on on Marathon Beach. And they were opposed by 10,000 Athenians. And the Athenians won. It was such a rout that their general sent out people to burn down the ship so they couldn't get away. The leftovers. That general was that same young fellow. He became the greatest hero of the Athenians because he acted as if he was brave. So that's what an apprentice is. I like that because I often think the question, who am I? Is such a flawed question. I think I often encourage people to ask the question, who do I want to be? And, and your answer to that is or the Socrates phrase there, the, the aphorism is quite apt, seem like the person you want to be. Mm. I want to go back, though, to, to when you're saying that therapy brings people up to normal and then spirituality can take people above normal. And positive psychology, yeah. Okay. So... Normal is this midway point between the walking wounded and an enlightened state of being. Well, enlightened is the eventual goal. I'm sure I'm not yet enlightened. I'm working at it. But there's too much scar tissue there. I think I'll have to have another go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, look, your mood is, is habitual. Say you. Uh, win a million dollars in the lottery. You'll be on top of the world for a while, but soon enough you revert to your previous level of misery if you were miserable before. Mm. Or I've got friends who, who, who suffer terrible health problems, early stroke or something like that. But they were cheerful, positive people before, and they adapted to the new situation and became cheerful, positive people with physical handicaps. But so, so that means that if your normal is miserable, then you'll stay miserable regardless of what's out there. But the tools of positive psychology can move this so-called hedonic adaptation up. What I hear is uh, I could be miserable and poor or miserable with a million dollars. <laughs> but you're also adding to that you could be happy, poor, and happy, no matter what circumstances thrown at you, whether it's a, an adverse event or a fortuitous event. Mm. I'm not convinced that normality fits into that, that equation. I don't, I'm not sure if normality is a, is a helpful way to perhaps think about the midpoint between the scar tissue and the enlightened sentient being. Well, normal, one of the meanings of it is average, and the mode is the most frequent point. So it's not necessarily the middle, it's the most frequent. And if you look around society, the most frequent is people who just struggle by. I'd agree with you with that, yeah. It, it, particularly in societies like Australian communities where, you, you know, the, there's all the comforts of the world, but you look at the street, you look at people walking down the street, their heads are down, they're buried in their phones, maybe they're buried in, in everywhere but the present. Look, I start this book on depression by giving people nine tools. One is muscular relaxation, relax your body. I was practicing that before our interview. <laughs> <laughs> and second one is meditation, and there are two different forms that I describe, which is mindfulness meditation and guided imagery. 
But then there are seven things you can do, and if you have a good dose of all, all seven, then you're resilient. You, you can cope with anything. And in order of difficulty, these are healthy eating, satisfying sleep, exercise, but what I call antidepressant exercise. You know, you don't go hell for leather. Fun, creativity, social connectedness, and meaning. And what is not on the list is wealth, success, status, beauty, romantic love, youth, physical health, absence of pain, freedom from stress, having a job, getting out of the job, marriage or other thing that you don't want, and all these other things people associate with their mood. I like what is not on that list. It's very intriguing. And also not, what's not on that list is normality. <laughs> Because I think sometimes there's a seduction of normality the same way that we are seduced by wealth or seduced by romantic love, seduced by what we think other people may have but we don't. And what other people think of us. Oh, absolutely. That's a terrible uh, hammer to, to hit your head with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the fear that uh, other people think that we're not normal or the fear that, that someone thinks we're normal and boring. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think social comparison is, is very influential on people's mood and depression if they're not resilient against it. Well, one of the biggest problems for many people is social anxiety. And you know what the best cure for it is? What's the best cure for social anxiety? Uh, an organization called Toastmasters. Oh, right. The public speaking club. Yep. But they don't know they're actually very effective group therapy against social anxiety. Marvellous. I, I sent lots and lots of my clients to Toastmasters. Oh, excellent. I did it for a while myself. Fantastic. So I think normality has been an interesting st starting point for, for this discussion. And we've talked about positive psychology, acceptance, commitment therapy, mindfulness, guided meditation. And also you're talking about happy movement, movement for, for not hell for leather movement, but what was the, the exercise well, you were talking about? Antidepressant exercise. Now, it is to the point where it's still pleasant. No pain involved. If before you start your session, say, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And then once you get into it, you're all right. Then it's too, for antidepressant, that's too hard. Okay. Then you need to cut back. And at the same time, you need to t keep records because even though you're not not trying to improve, and you're not trying to compete with anybody else, you will be improving. And looking back over your record, say, hey, three weeks ago I could only do 30 push-ups, and now I'm up to 50. Amazing. How did I do that? I like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it's true that when sometimes incremental change can go by unnoticed, uh, and then you sort of look back and you go, oh, wow, you know, there's been some some markers of, and I think that's one of the, the few forms of comparison which I would advocate for is not comparison of yourself against others, but comparison of your performance over time or comparison of your contentment over time. I like the word contentment. Mm. Why do you use that word? Well, in that I disagree with every expert on, on positive psychology, including the Dalai Lama. They all talk about happiness. Oh, yes, one of the classics of the positive psychology writings is The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. Yes. Wonderful man. But they all talk about happiness. But happiness is, is transitory. If I'm above what, what's usual for me, I'm happy. If I'm below what's usual for me, I'm unhappy. Uh, look, there is this very shy young fella, never been kissed, goes to a party, gets drunk, maybe takes a few Ill illegal pills, and, hey, goes home with a girl and has a one-night stand. He's happy as. But when they wake up in the same bed in the morning and have absolutely nothing in common, he, his happiness goes, goes right down to two out of ten or one out of ten. Mm, mm. But the discontent was not negated by this experience. In fact, you'd probably feel worse afterward. And in, con in contrast, 
uh, for some years I had regular seven or eight out of ten pain. I didn't know it, but I had a stalactite growing in my hip, pushing the leg bone out. Oof. I should have gone for an x-ray, but I just, what I did, did I used my Buddhist tools and simply managed to cope with it without trouble. And I remember one night, on my, on one of the positive psychology tools is the gratitude list. When I go to bed at night, one night my, on my gratitude list was, hey, today that pain never went above seven out of, out of ten. Beauty. I was not happy having that pain, but I had, on the typical working day, eight clients with 15-minute breaks in between them, and then a home visit with that pain, and I was content with life. I had contentment without the happiness, while this hypothetical young fellow had momentarily the happiness without the contentment. Mm. One thing I got from the book, The Art of Happiness, and thanks for sharing that story because it, it, it demonstrates the difference between happiness and pleasure. And you know, we have other words for different things, Con contentment, fulfillment, because there's a subtle difference on each one and, and there's a subtle difference of focus. And I, I share your misgivings about focusing too much on happiness. It's not that we want people to be unhappy, but that if unhappiness and, and pleasure can bleed too easily into each other and, and we might lose focus. But if, if we can focus on fulfillment, on contentment, on the, the underlying mood behind every emotion, then there's perhaps, I'll say, a, a more constructive place to make decisions within your own life, a more constructive place to wake up each day and achieve what you want to achieve. I can illustrate your point by switching to, to relationships. Interesting, okay. Okay. Many people say, I want someone to love me. Mm. That little word, me. Take it out, I want someone to love. Giving love, but love instead of taking love makes a huge amount of difference. Look, I've been married for 53 and a half years to the same person. That's because she wants to give to me and I want to give to her. We never had... I want from you. When my father died in Hungary, I inherited some money, which was quite substantial in Hungary and not quite enough for a cup of coffee, but, you know, maybe about a thousand dollars in Australia. So I said to my brother, you keep it. He managed to transfer to me every cent, right? This is giving love. I wanted to give to him, not he was giving to me. That's the way to a good life. Mm. And choosing to, to surround ourselves with people like that mm. is really important because I, I think one of the, the challenges, particularly in, in today's day and age, is having that generosity, having that, that giving spirit, but protecting yourself from giving too much to the narcissists, to, to the selfish people who want to take, take, take. Because I, I really do believe that we live in a, a takeaway culture that breeds the I want mentality. And how do you be generous of spirit, but also protect yourself against the narcissists? It's a consumer society. In order to have all that wealth at the top, it is necessary for people to be good consumers and good little wage slaves. So I have lived deliberately below the poverty line since 1978. Sometimes when I you know, had too many clients, I couldn't help accumulating money, but I use it for useful purposes rather than just buying stuff. But mostly, we've managed to live not by working for money and spending money, but by doing things. And I set out the logic for this outrageous idea at an essay called How to Change the World at my blog, which is Bobbing Around. Bobbing Around. Bobbing around. Bobbing around with Dr. Bob Rich. <laughs> yeah. So if I won't give you the, the URL, the, the web address, but if you look up Bobbing Around and put Dr. Bob Rich, it'll come up. And there is an essay there, How to Change the World, and there I set out How to Change the World. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you are the change you want to see in the world. You are living what you preach. You're not 
this isn't empty words. These are words that you've, you're deliberately living and, and acting out in your world. Mm. Dr. Rich, before we close up, I'd like to ask you, what questions do you think we should ask about things like normality? Well, first one is why stop there? And the second one, it is okay to be normal. It's okay to be wounded. Whatever it is, is all right. I do like that question, why stop at normal? Yeah. I like that question. And I think that's, that's very much in ethos with where you talk about therapy for the scars and then, and then spirituality to, yeah. to become enlightened. Dr. Bob Rich, thank you very much for your time. Dr. Paul Mason, it was my pleasure and my honour. Namaste. Mm-hmm.